Okay, so hello and welcome everybody to this Atmos webinar. And today we're going to be diving into how to survey in 45 kilometers an hour or 28 mile an hour winds with Marlin. My name is James McLaughlin. I'm a business developer with Atmos. And uh, for those who've uh, seen our webinars before, uh, that's absolutely fantastic. We're going to be doing a deep dive today into Marlin's wind capabilities and some best practices in the field. For those of you who are perhaps new to uh, Marlin or uh, perhaps the Atmos company, what I'd recommend to do is after this webinar, also take a look at our website and also dive into uh, our intro to Marlin webinar, which you can find on YouTube, where you can find a live demonstration and also some of the unique things that you get with our Marlin drone. But today is going to be all about wind. And wind is a bit like electricity. You know that it's everywhere, but you can never be really sure until you feel it. Now, the first thing I'm going to touch on is what we're going to be getting up to today when we talk about wind. Now, I asked you guys uh, in your registration what you wanted to see, what you wanted to find out, and here are the results. So you wanted to know a bit about the logistics of performing UAV surveys in the wind, uh, some in-depth info about a real use case that we did with Marlin, some hard evidence of wind capabilities, because after all, just saying that it can do it is not enough. You really wanna see uh, some evidence behind it. And finally, how wind affects the GSD and also the accuracy that you can get with Marlin. So we'll actually be covering all of these today. And uh, I will be going through each of these piece by piece. And actually, the goals of this webinar is firstly to share high wind surveying best practices in terms of what we've gained from our experiences out in the field. And then also to demonstrate how Marlin is the tool for showing you how you can execute those best practices also. So firstly, I'm going to touch a little bit on Marlin. Then we're going to dive straight into the logistical stuff. So how to get the best results in high winds, how to forecast, how to plan your flights. When you get into the field, what should you do? What should you do when the drone's in the air? And finally, getting those best survey results and coming in to land at the end. Then we'll dive straight into a use case of Marlin having flown in a really high wind environment. What are the results like? What can I expect? And then we'll finish up with a little bit of a Q&A. Now, in terms of Q&A, if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, down the bottom of your screen, you'll see a small Q&A button. Feel free to enter your questions in there. My colleague, Ruth, is going to be answering some of those during the webinar as we go along, and I'll also be answering some of them at the end. Now, firstly, Marlin, you can see this is the latest release, the Cobalt release of our Marlin drone. What I wanna put forward to you here is that Marlin is the only VTOL drone which is designed for use in high winds. What do I mean by high winds? By high winds, I mean 45 kilometers an hour in takeoff and landing. We're based right next to the coast here in the Netherlands. And so if we wanna do any sort of surveying, testing, demoing or anything like that, we need to be able to handle these high winds that come whipping in off the coast. What this means is that because you can fly a little at a much higher wind speed than other VTOL drones or other fixed wing drones, that can give you, depending on your location, up to 30% more flying days, which is really, really useful if you're considering your bottom line. Now, the first thing we'll dive into is some forecasting and some planning. Now, when you're going out and doing a survey in the field, the first thing that you're gonna be doing is checking the wind forecast. Now, when you're doing this, it's important to understand a little bit of the background as to what these forecasts mean and some of the pitfalls that can come along with it. Now, most wind forecasts and most weather forecasts in general are based at 10 meters elevation or less. Now, the problem with this is that wind at this altitude is in something called a boundary layer. Boundary layer meaning that it's being affected by things like buildings, trees, and other objects on the ground. This has the effect of dragging the wind, essentially slowing it. So what that essentially means is that uh, the wind at the altitude of the forecast can be up to 50% lower than what's actually going to be the case at 
the transition altitude or even your mapping altitude as well. So when you're considering the wind forecast, it's very, very important to always consider not the wind at the ground level, but actually the wind at the altitude at which you're going to be surveying. Now, there are different models and different uh, types of weather forecasts that will be able to tell you this. Now, I'm going to touch on two of them right here, but of course, there are more all around the world. These two are GFS, which is from the USA, and ICON, which is from Germany. Now, depending on which model you use, the wind could actually be a completely different speed. So it's important to understand the difference between these two. Uh, the difference in terms of time is that GFS is modeling with a one minute average wind speed. So the sustained wind gust is measured over one minute, whereas for ICOM, it's measured over 10 minutes, uh, which means that the, uh, the sustained wind speed for GFS, depending on the situation, can be slightly higher than that for ICON because it's going to be measuring it over a shorter period of time. So it can pick up those small gusts. Uh, on the other hand, GFS is measuring over a larger area than it is with ICON. So if you're interested in say more localized wind forecasts, then ICON can be the stronger wind forecast to use. So it's important to understand the differences between the two when you're actually making your forecast. So once you've understand, understood the differences in altitude and the differences with different uh, wind models, it's important now to actually make your forecast. So uh, there are different uh, forecasting websites that will enable you to verify the wind at your location. So you can use WindFinder Weather Online. We actually use WindFinder. Uh, but the best thing for you that I'd recommend when you're going out to do a survey in the field is have a look around some different websites and see what gives you the most accurate or the worst case scenario for your particular area. If you're always conservative and you ensure that you're always working to the highest weather forecast, then wind forecast, then you know that you have the highest chance that it's going to be accurate in the field. Now, to give you a bit of an example as to how we would do it when we were going out and doing a survey, this is an example of a plot from WindFinder. And what you can see is that uh, the sustained wind speed is much lower than the wind gust. So it's important to always look at the wind gust speed, not the sustained wind speed. And it's important here to see that actually the wind is up at or over the limit of, or the 45 kilometer limit of our drone, even though it doesn't say it here in the forecast. So for example, here at five o'clock, it says there's gonna be a wind gust of 43 kilometers per hour. Now we typically will use a 20% margin on top of that. So if you consider the wind at altitude, it's gonna be above the 45 kilometer in our limit of the drone. And so therefore will not be safe to fly. So it's really important to understand that difference between models and difference between altitudes to prevent from taking off in a condition which is outside the allowable limits of any drone, not just Marinin. But what this does show is that wind can be very transient, very changeable. And so it's really important to have a drone which has a larger wind resistance. Because if you do end up in a situation where perhaps the forecast has been inaccurate, then it's good to have that extra margin in place to know that you're going to be safe and you're going to be able to bring the drone home. Now, once you've made your forecast, it's now time to make a flight plan. Now, with other drones, this can be a bit more of a problem than with Marlin. Now, the reason for this is because in high winds, if you are working in a crosswind, so the wind coming from here, then this can result in quite a, um, quite a changeable uh, drone flight along the flight line. It can end up zigzagging along its flight line. Likewise, if you then plan the flight directly into and directly against the wind, uh, then your frontal overlap on the upwind legs is going to be uh, very, very high. The pictures are going to be very, very close together. And then on the downwind legs, of course, the pictures are going to be very far apart. So this can be quite difficult to make work. Now with Marilyn, because it's been designed for high winds, especially when the wind's below 35 kilometers an hour, it actually doesn't matter which direction you align your flight lines with regards to the wind. That means that you have the ability to plan those big, long, slender flight lines that are the most efficient. Uh, when the winds are higher than 35 kilometers an hour, uh, what we recommend to do, of course, is to have 
the flight lines at about a 45 degree angle to the wind direction. But the good thing is with Marlin is this isn't essential. So if because of your survey area, you're required to have a certain specific area you have to fly and the wind's still very high, then you are able to do that. The one thing we do recommend is if possible, where you notice you have some wider radius turns, the narrow radius turns, plan those narrow radius turns into the wind. And so if you do have the choice and you are able to do so, you have the wind coming from say this direction if, uh, if it's going to be higher than 35 kilometers per hour. So you've made your forecast and you plan your flight. It's now time to head into the field. And so some best practices in the field firstly start with planning a safe takeoff location. So uh, it's important to note that when you are out in the field, despite what you've looked at in the forecast, things like hills, dams, trees, uh, buildings, and other things like that can have the effect of accelerating and changing the wind. Now you can see in this case, uh, there's a hill and the wind coming over that hill has accelerated as it's gone over the hill has, as indicated by the light blue area. And then behind the hill, that's created a wake. So an area of turbulence in which the wind is swirling around in different directions and can be gusting at different speeds. Now that's a problem for the drone in two ways. If the air is turbulent, then that means the drone has trouble maintaining its direction. It's always better if it's pointed directly into the wind. And in the area of accelerated wind speed, the area can be up to, uh, sorry, the wind can be up to 50% higher. An example of this is a flight which one of our customers has done in South America. Uh, the sustained wind speed or the wind gust speed uh, was actually below 40 kilometers an hour. It was taking off behind a dam. Um, we found from the flight data afterwards that the wind speed immediately above it was 73 kilometers an hour. So almost double the top, uh, top wind limits of the drone. So it's really important to, uh, to figure this out when you're out in the field, where's the safest place to take off, a nice wide open area. You wanna avoid the hills or berms as much as possible. Uh, one thing I would say is with Marilyn, you do have the ability, if you do come into this uh, type of situation where the wind at a very, very local point is a bit higher, you have the uh, advantage of being able to take manual control. And so when you have manual control of the drone, uh, what you can do is then bring the drone up to a higher altitude in helicopter mode. So she's clear of any areas where the wind is accelerating and then move away to a calmer area and bring the drone in for a nice controlled landing. When you're out in the field also, it's also important to, even if all the other steps have been taken and completed successfully, it's good to get a backup reading with an in-field anemometer. Um, it's always important to point that into the wind as well. We use a, a wind vane on a, on a camera tripod. And uh, this just serves as the absolute backup for all the other readings you've done and make sure that you're going to be safe when you go to take off. Also, when you're in the field, there are all, uh, different things to consider as well. Say Marilyn is positioned uh, on the ground before the flight. It's quite handy to position the, the side with the lowest frontal area um, into the wind. So turn Marilyn 90 degrees so that the wind isn't moving directly into the wings. Uh, you can also put it behind a car or something else to ensure that Marilyn doesn't get blown away if the wind gusts get too high. But um, once you've taken all those uh, precautions, you've measured the wind, you've looked at the forecast, you've made a great flight plan, it's now time to go and take off and to go and do a survey. So that's what we're gonna be looking at now. Uh, before we start looking at actually taking off and flying, it's really important to understand uh, the difference between the ground speed and the airspeed to enable you to be safer in flight. Now, the airspeed is actually the wind speed or the airspeed that the drone is seeing. So that's the speed of the air which is moving over the drone's wings and is measured by the pitot tube on the drone. The ground speed is actually the speed that the drone is moving across the ground. And this is actually measured by GPS. So the effect that the wind can have on this difference is illustrated here. You can see that if the drone holds the same airspeed of 60 kilometers per hour, but the wind is directly against the drone at 20 kilometers an hour, 
the ground speed, so the speed at which Marilyn is essentially surveying across the ground is going to be the subtraction of those two. So 40 kilometers per hour. Likewise, if the wind direction is reversed and the wind is behind the drone and the drone has an airspeed of 60 kilometers per hour, then the ground speed, so the speed the drone is surveying across the ground is 80 kilometers an hour. Now, the great thing about this is if you understand the difference between these two, then you can actually get a really uh, accurate measure of the wind speed when the drone is on its directly upwind and directly downwind legs. So this means that when you're in flight with Marlin's Navigator software, you can use this airspeed and ground speed reading that you can see just here. Uh, if you subtract those, then you can see, especially when the drone is facing directly into the wind, that uh, whether the wind speed is within the allowable limits or not. So you've done all your forecasting, you've done all your local measurements, but you get up in the air, the aircraft transitions, she's heading into the wind and you notice that the subtracted number is higher than 45 kilometers an hour. You have the ability to trigger the go home function and bring the drone home for a nice safe landing before anything has the chance to, uh, to go wrong in this case. And actually what's gonna be coming in very near upgrades of the Navigator software, our flight planning and flight uh, monitoring software, is actually the wind speed is going to be mentioned there as a single number. So you don't have to do any mathematics when you're out there in the field. Now, uh, it's important as well when the drone's in the air to look at the type of imagery that it's getting, because it's not enough just to fly when you get up there. You also have to be able to catch a good survey data. Now, it's important to note that a drone with single engines, so a fixed wing drone with single engines, uh, when it's facing into a crosswind, it needs to bank its wings, like you can see in the image there on the left, in order to counteract the force of the wind. What that has the effect of is bringing the camera off its nadir, so off its directly downwards position. And that means that firstly, your frontal, over, uh, sorry, your side overlap is going to be affected. And secondly, it means that the GSD is not going to be constant across each image. The side which is closer to the ground will have a lower GSD than that which is further away, which is a big issue. Um, with Marlin, you don't have that issue. The reason being is that we have firstly two engines to control the aircraft's position during the flight, to control its yaw. And secondly, we have a big stable tail fin, which enables those crosswind effects to have a lesser effect on the flight of the drone. So the end result is that Marlin, despite having a slight angle of bank, will what's called crab along the flight line when there's a crosswind. And that means that the camera is pointed nadir directly at the ground and your survey results are gonna be much better than what you would get from a fixed wing drone with just a single engine. It also allows Marlin to fly at much higher wind speeds and also with a much uh, lower overlap. So other drones will recommend that you go and take off and fly with a 70 or 80% side overlap. Uh, with Marlin, you can get away with a 60% side overlap, even at high wind speeds. And we'll be showing you that a little bit later when we get to our use case. So once you've gone out and you've done your uh, flying in the winds, uh, it's now come time to uh, come in for landing. And so when you're landing with a VTOL drone in high winds, it's really important. Well, two things are really important. Firstly, is to maintain the position above the home point. So the drone's gonna be leaning into the wind in order to do so. And secondly, when you land, it is really important to have no horizontal speed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a video of a, a landing with Marlin and winds that were actually above the requirement. It was slightly above 45 kilometers now. And what you'll notice that the pilot does is he uh, takes manual control of the drone when the drone's at 20 meters above the ground. The drone will come in for landing and you'll see a la uh, leaning into the wind. And then just above the ground, about half a meter above the ground, the pilot will stop. The drone will automatically kill any horizontal wind speed automatically. And then he just brings the drone down. As soon as the drone hits the ground, the engines turn off and Marlin's got a really nice stable cross pl uh, platform underneath. So that means that it's a nice stable base when the weight, when the engines turn off and the weight of the drone brings it to the ground, there's no uh, hopping and there's no sliding or tipping over like you can get with some other VTOL drones. 
So I'll show you this video here. So you can see the drone is automatically coming down to 20 meters of altitude, leaning into the wind. And it's also at this time that the, uh, that the pilot has taken control, you've just heard his call. He's bringing the drone down to about half a meter above the ground. You can see the drone leaning into the wind. And then at this point, he's gonna stop the drone. The drone's gonna kill any horizontal speed. And then you can see the drone hits the ground as soon as it does so, engines turn off and that nice stable base means that the drone makes a safe and successful landing, even at very high wind speeds, which are actually out of the spec of the drone. So that is essentially the logistics of how to go out and fly a successful survey in high winds. Now, what we're gonna dive into now is what you guys asked for, which is a little bit of some hard evidence and some uh, ideas of the survey results of a real survey with Marilyn, which she's done in very high winds. So the actual survey task was representative of a basic survey task that a surveyor would go out and do in the field. So this was a basic corridor, only about 24 hectares, so 1.3 kilometer corridor. So only a 12 minute flight or so. So quite a small flight for a fixed wing drone. Uh, we did the flight at 110 meters of altitude, corresponding to just under one and a half centimeters of GSD. And as I mentioned before, despite uh, the wind conditions on site, we only used a 60% side overlap for the flight. The frontal overlap uh, with the Navigator software, you can actually choose between time triggered uh, imagery or position triggered imagery. In this case, it was time triggered imagery. And so essentially the camera was taking a photo every one second. And so the frontal overlap was automatically determined by the drone speeding up and slowing down in its airspeed to maintain a somewhat constant ground speed. The drone which we used for the survey was obviously our Marlin UAS, uh, equipped with the 42 megapixel Sony camera. Uh, we also had the Septentrio PPK installed as well, but the most important thing were the wind conditions on site. So this is actually a image of the forecast from the day in question. This is back on the 27th of October last year. Uh, so you can see from this wind forecast that firstly it was using the GFS forecasting model, which tends to be the most accurate for our area. And if you look up at us in the Netherlands, you can see that the color there is, is I suppose a slight blue aquamarine, which is corresponding to about 25 knots in the legend down here. Uh, now, if we uh, also look just offshore, uh, you can see that it was also slightly darker. So that means that the winds were at the coastline somewhere between 25 and 30 knots, which corresponds to about 50 kilometers an hour or 30 miles an hour. Uh, so this is obviously above the recommended survey above the recommended survey uh, wind speed of the drone. However, we'd flown with this many times before, so it was considered to be okay for the conditions uh, on that day. But of course, as I've just described, the forecast isn't everything. It also, uh, the wind can be different on site. So in order to give you some in-flight evidence that you requested of the wind conditions, we also have a plot of the uh, data from the autopilot during the flight. Now, what this shows is the difference between the airspeed and the ground speed during the survey. And so what this means is that if we subtract the airspeed at the ground speed at the times that Marlin was directly going into the wind, we can actually find out the wind gusts that were found during the flight. So you can see the wind or the difference in airspeed and ground speed is measured on the left-hand side and the time during the flight goes along the x-axis. Uh, you can see that there's peaks and troughs on this graph, and this corresponds to the times that Marilyn was either going in an upwind or downwind direction. But what's most important are the absolute maximums and minimums of this graph, because these show the maximum wind gusts which were encountered during the survey. So what you can see is that at the, I suppose, at the gustiest point, Marilyn faced a wind gust of 57 kilometers an hour during her flight. Uh, but also had sustained wind gusts of 50 kilometers an hour during the upwind legs as well. So what this proves essentially is that this survey was taken 
with Marilyn at her absolute wind limits, or actually above her wind limits. So it's really interesting then to go in and see what effect this has on the results that you get out of the survey. So this is a plot of the overlap that was, a, uh, that was obtained throughout the corridor. Uh, there are two things that are really important to mention. Firstly, that uh, the flight lines themselves are still very straight because of Marilyn's twin rotor control and also because of the large stable tail fin. Uh, she was able to stay on her line despite the fact that uh, there were some quite high winds that were gusting around on site. Also, what you can see is that throughout roughly 90% of the survey area, uh, the image overlap requirements were at the nine or above level, which is required for a good survey. So even though we use 60% overlap, even though the winds were so high, uh, we were still able to get a really, really nice model out of it. Now, in terms of the accuracy, uh, we had a number of known points across this survey area that we did. Uh, six of them were used as ground control points, but we also used five of them as checkpoints to verify the absolute accuracy. Now, it's a general rule of thumb that X and Y absolute accuracy is generally speaking about two to three times the GSD of the model. Now, if you remember, our model had a 1.45 centimeter GSD. Our X and Y errors came out roughly about two times the GSD, which is a really good result. But the most important thing is actually the vertical errors. Now, these are typically, as a rule of thumb, about three or four times the uh, GSD of the model. Now, despite the fact that we had high winds and 60% uh, overlap and the area was mostly very flat uh, road and grassy area, we were still able to obtain Z errors in the absolute of 1.53 centimeters, which is really, really impressive and completely within what you would expect for a drone survey uh, to go out and do for your customers as well. So I think what this proves is that Marlin can, is a drone that you can take out in high winds, do your regular survey tasks and still come out with really good results. And so what I wanna do now is I also wanna show you uh, some more imagery, some more videos I should say, of Marlin going up and doing flights and surveys in high winds. So I'm gonna show you a video. Marlin's gonna take off. Um, then you're gonna see an, one of Marlin's emergency options. So Marlin's gonna transition in the middle of her flight and then continue on to uh, the rest of the flight. This is actually an emergency function which is new with our Cobalt release. And it's a safety feature there for you surveyors. If a helicopter comes into your area, uh, you have the ability to pause the flight and then continue. And then we're gonna show again Marlin coming in for a landing. So you can see Marlin's here in the field. The wind conditions on this day were between nine to 15 meters per second. So that's around about 45 kilometers an hour, roughly about 28 to 30 miles an hour. You can see Marlin takes off. As soon as she takes off, she moves back a bit to catch the wind as such before moving back to her home point. Still nice and stable in those high winds. And then she transitions and moves into airplane mode, takes some time to gauge the wind speed and direction, and then moves off towards her survey area. And it's at this point, we're also going to see a, a emergency transition. So in the middle of the flight, Marlin transitions, you can see her catching the wind. And the most important thing here is despite the gusts up to 15 meters per second, so above our 12 and a half meter a second wind limit, Marlin holds her position really well and then can move straight back into her mapping flight. Now we can see on landing, we're gonna get another example of how you land here in high wind conditions with a VTOL. So you come down to just above the ground level, Marlin's gonna hold her position, kill the horizontal wind speed, uh, kill the horizontal speed, and then as she hits the ground, the motors will turn off and then that nice stable base means she doesn't tip or bounce or anything like that. So you end up with a nice safe landing. So to wrap it all up, uh, the three points that I really want you guys to take away from this webinar is firstly, when you're going out to survey with a drone at high winds, getting the right forecast and 
making sure that you're conservative before and during the flight are really, really critical. And it's always important to monitor those local conditions because they can have a major effect on the local wind speed, regardless of what you're forecasting and perhaps even your anemometer readings might be saying. But the most important thing that I want you guys to take away is that with Marlin, you have a tool that you can comfortably survey at winds of up to 45 kilometers an hour. And I guess we've demonstrated you can do it technically more, but we like to be conservative so you're nice and safe. But if you didn't want to take our word for it, that's absolutely fine as well. What I recommend you do after this webinar is head onto our website at mossuav.com. Uh, if you head to the news section, we have a blog post, which we put on last week, which covers the use case that I just talked about briefly, but much more in depth. You can also have the ability to see some more of our outputs. You can also see uh, the quality report from the post-processing. You can download the data yourself. If you want to have a bit of a look at the data and verify it yourself to see what the results are like from Marlin. Uh, what you can also do on our website is on the product page, you can go to a wind benefit calculator. And essentially what that will do is it will give you the number of days that you can fly more with Marlin at a 45 kilometer an hour wind limit than any other fixed wing drone with a 30 kilometer an hour wind limit. You can enter in your location and it'll show you that straight away, which is really nice for that return on investment or benefit calculation. But uh, what I want to do is thank you for joining me for this webinar all about Marlin flying in the wind. Uh, what my colleague's going to do now is he's going to put up a poll. If you do want uh, to have some further contact, if you have some questions, you want to find out more information, you want to set up a demonstration, uh, you can indicate here and then through the magic of modern technology, one of my colleagues will be in touch and we can continue the conversation there. So what I'm going to do is dive into our Q&A. Okay, so we've got what are the wind limits of Marlin in flight? So I can say definitively, um, so we have in takeoff and landing, which is the most important, uh, the most important one, uh, the wind limit is 45 kilometers an hour or 12 and a half meters a second or 28 miles an hour. Um, when the drone is in an airplane mode, so her, her mapping mode, uh, that steps up to 50 kilometers an hour and above. But the main limiting factor is going to be uh, indeed the, the helicopter mode, the takeoff and landing mode of 45 kilometers an hour. It's also important to when other drone manufacturers are claiming certain wind speeds, it's important to check at what flight regime they're talking about. Some people will say, okay, we have a 40, 45, 50 kilometer an hour wind resistance, but then for takeoff and landing, it will be 30 kilometers an hour. And so really the relevance is slightly lost because by the time you're transitioning at your transition altitude, of course, uh, even at 40, 50 meters, the, the wind is gonna be much higher. So. Um, that's always something that I would uh, recommend to consider. Um, do we cover the belly landing UAV operations in high wind? No, we're not going to be covering the belly landing stuff. Uh, so indeed, belly landers have much more difficulty with uh, high winds. Firstly, because as I mentioned before, most of them have that single, uh, single motor there. Um, and that makes for, for difficulties when you're flying in crosswinds because the drone has to bank against the wind, which of course um, has negative effects on your side overlap and also just means that the drone is going to be constantly moving across her flight line. So the, the imagery is not going to be as good and it's going to be more unpredictable. Um, but um, this is not something you have to worry about with Marlin. And then of course you have the landing process, which is you know, also something which is much riskier with a belly lander in the wind as well. Does Marilyn always need to fly crosswind when mapping? Uh, no, she doesn't. So indeed, uh, winds of lower than 35 kilometers an hour, you can actually orient the wind in any direction. So against the wind, uh, with a crosswind, anything you like. When the wind is above 35 kilometers an hour, uh, it is preferable, but not essential to have the wind direction at about a 45 degree angle 
to your flight lines. Um, but as you can see from the from the use case, also if you jump on and read the blog post, you'll be able to, to see that at various times during that flight, Marilyn was directly into the wind and then also in a direct crosswind. And that didn't have actually much of an effect on the, or didn't have really any effect on the side overlap um, or the amount of, of images that you were able to get within that area. So um, to answer your question, no, you don't need to fly crosswind when mapping. Uh, we also got a question, does the pilot need to turn the UAV into the wind for landing? Good question. Uh, Marlin does indeed need to transition into the wind every time she comes in for landing. However, Marlin will detect this automatically. So you don't need to worry about having to do anything. Uh, essentially from takeoff throughout the flight until 20 meters before the ground, Marlin is going to be uh, completely automatic. So I can see there's actually quite a few questions in there. So what we'll do is for those of you who we don't get to, uh, well, we, those of you who we haven't got to, sorry, uh, we will actually get in touch with you in person. Um, so uh, I will wrap it up now. So thanks again for joining us on our WIN webinar. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to, uh, to speak to you today. And if you do wanna get in touch with us further, the poll is still open. Feel free to jump in there and uh, indicate that you want to speak to us and we'll look forward to seeing you on our next webinar.